The UNAIDS has a, an ambitious strategy called 90-90-90. It's the UNAIDS strategy. So by 2030, 90% of people in the world will have been tested for HIV and know their status. And 90% of the people who test positive will have started treatment. And 90% of people who have started treatment will have their viral load in their blood reduced to undetectable levels. Indigenous people are afraid that we will continue to be the 10-10-10, that we will continue to be left behind. And that unless we are identified as a key affected population, and unless governments work with indigenous people to be in, con in the leadership of the HIV response in indigenous communities, we will be left behind. Because it's only through indigenous leadership that indigenous people will listen. The leaders of the working group want countries around the world who have indigenous populations to collect data on who's getting HIV. We need indigenous epidemiological data to show what we know. We know that indigenous people are at higher risk than the general population in most countries for contracting HIV and AIDS and other sexually transmitted infections and bloodborne infections. But we need the evidence. You know, in a lot of countries where that have indigenous populations, they don't keep track of, the, of HIV with indigenous people. So when they collect epidemiological information, they don't record whether someone's indigenous or not. I think that uh, the invisibility of, of indigenous people also exists within the HIV movement itself. Aboriginal people represent about 4% of the population in Canada, and yet we represent about 12.5% of new infections every year. So that, that, that's really disproportionate to the rest of the country, and that, and that really shows um, that indigenous people need to be included as a key affected population in a lot of countries around the world. There was a study between New Zealand, Australia, and Canada where we realized that the patterns are different too. So in Canada, almost 60% of uh, infections, uh, the mode of transmission is uh, men who have sex with men. The number one mode of transmission, the way people are getting it, is through injection drug use, Aboriginal people. And the second way they're getting it is through heterosexual activity. And in the Aboriginal community, the third mode of transmission is the men who have sex with men. So all this messaging going out to gay white men is not reaching our women living on reserve with children. The, the messaging just doesn't make sense to them. It's not for them. So that's one of the reasons why the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network exists and why there are Aboriginal specific AIDS service organizations and why the International Indigenous Working Group on HIV and AIDS exists. What we would like is more countries to support um, indigenous people to lead their own response because it's only through uh, the community leadership that the in, the indigenous people will get a handle on this. Otherwise, we will be left behind. We'll be part of the group that gets left behind. And in many cases, we already are because we're invisible in the statistics. And now, here I am at the international level as representing um, civil society in North America, but I'm, uh, I, I'm bringing it from my own personal perspective uh, as an indigenous person living with HIV. And this is the first time where an indigenous person representing an indigenous organization is sitting at the table on the program coordinating board of uh, UNAIDS. So this is something special and it's, uh, it's a first and we hope it's just the beginning of trying to influence the world to identify indigenous people as a key affected population at greater risk for HIV and AIDS so that we can create uh, indigenous specific responses and resources and, um, and build capacity in the indigenous community to respond.